Okay, good day everyone. Uh, first, I'd just like to thank the organizer for accepting my paper and uh, also for organizing this very interesting session. Uh, the paper I'm presenting today is based on some of the results from my PhD and it focuses on the reasons behind regional transformation and social political strategies. And this paper will present some kind of theoretical and also methodological concepts around this and how we try and identify them. Uh, sort of a presumption or hypothesis is that the reliance and utilization of the sea set the stage for a more kind of advanced social political organization. And the technological innovations, specifically ship technology, helped turn this kind of uh, the sea into a kind of connective arena of interaction and trade. And this is um, testified by the emergence of a very homogeneous material assembly in a fairly short period of time from the southern tip of Norway uh, here all the way up to the southern borders of Tums up there. So this is a stretch of coast that is roughly 1500 kilometers long or 800 nautical miles uh, which is quite a large area and, and I would argue though kind of cautiously that there are very few areas in Europe where you do find the same same uninterrupted uh, homogeneous material assembly as you do here. And this is despite the fact that these societies are juxtaposed by a long coastline of, of uh, uh, climatic and ecological distinctiveness that would have forced insular practices and in both subsistence and organization. Now what we see is the emergence of pressure flight technology, uh, simple shaft hole axis, metal objects of course, uh, as well as uh, homogeneous settlement practice in the form of longhouses. First two air longhouses like this, and later three air longhouses. Uh, we also get burial rituals in the form of uh, more monumental burial mounds, either as earthen barrows, as you see here, or as naked kerns. Yeah, even though the material is similar over a large area, we also see great variation in social political complexity. Uh, both over time, but also concurrently within the region. So, so the, the question sort of is though, like how do we go about identifying this variation? Uh, now, theoretical frameworks that are concerned with identifying social political change are commonly kind of critiqued for being overly functionalistic, uh, evolutionary in nature, or generally ending up as a sort of, kind of this checklist archaeology where you look at evolutionary stages. Now, in attempting to move beyond these issues and towards a more eclectic approach, I've drawn from a model frequently referred to as collective action theory. Uh, where, and collective action theory try and overcome this dichotomy between more functionalistic approaches and more postmodernistic agents. But also, this theory has been critiqued in its sort of ineffectiveness in explaining why certain groups of people act in a certain way and how power strategies actually change and overlap within a region. Uh, now, I've tried to work around this issue by implementing Frederick Barth's classic idea of processes of categorization, illustrated with this model here, but maybe I just made everything more confusing. But I think the point I'm trying to make is that over regionally, the entire coast is, is circumscribed within this um, a sort of uh, homogeneous material assembly, as I mentioned. Um, a frequent communication would have created this sort of toxic mode of behavior or this taken for granted way of thinking. Uh, but as I will come back to in my case studies, there are still quite different levels of social political organization happening here, shown here through kind of two extremes, either recursive strategies or cooperative strategies. Both strategies, though, are developed through their independent factors, but they are limited by the local ecology, landscape, resource and subsistence potential, as you see here. Now, for example, in order for a coercive strategy to be initiated, you need a kind of an established political economy with the control of resources and the persuasive abilities um, to make people believe that such an organization actually is necessary. Uh, but you also could have like, cooperative strategies where um, Active choices are made in the way groups decide to act. However, for the northwestern Scandinavia, at least, a major reason why groups act in a certain way lies in their restrictions and or opportunities that is, is circumscribed by the local ecology or, or the landscape. 
And the second deciding factor is process of categorization, which means that power strategies are actualized through the categorical processes one group has over another and, and vice versa. So if one group exercises coercive strategies, this will undoubtedly have an effect on neighboring groups. And this will in turn act depending on their natural limitations, either through, through coercive strategies or through alternate strategies. So increased categorization is of course a kind of result from increased communication uh, and travel along the seaway. So that was just kind of my theoretical backdrop, but how do we go about identifying regional change within a large re region that is, as I've said now, based on the material assembly, quite similar. Now, an extensive archaeological corpus consisting of settlement and burial patterns, lithics, metal and rock art were incorporated to identify patterns of diachronic, regional and societal differences. Though working with such a large body of data, one kind of requires a way to systemize it. And here a combination of the statistical to Richter's K function and kernel density estimation in ArcGIS has proven quite fruitful. A Ripley K function kind of calculates different point data uh, multiple times from different distance bands, giving statistical significant clusters of the different time categories. Now, by looking for statistical clusters diachronically over a large area, regional concentrations and dispersions become visible. And although you know this can only be used as statistical readings and not proof of actual cultural groupings. They do provide the sort of staging ground for more in-depth studies of regional variation and change. So based on these readings, you get kind of an, a, a sort of a, an objective demarcation of areas of activity and variation over time, which can be used to identify regional groupings. And here you see a chart of the accumulation of the various data sets in each region over time for from the late Neolithic uh, down to the end of the early Bronze Age. Uh, here's just kind of very rough map illustrating different regions of activity. So, so again, this is helpful to some extent, but it does not reveal anything kind of about variation in social political organization. To do this, we need to go more in depth, and I will try and exemplify this through very, kind of very briefly through two case studies in Nosong and yeah, and in Kaume. So in Osong, uh, it's a highly mixed subsistence based on the local ecology. And as you can see from this kind of psychedelic map here, there's multiple vegetation zones with an extremely short area of each other. Uh, and this enables um, both cereal cultivation, uh, seasonal pastoralism, and extensive hunting grounds for hunting. Uh, they were definitely part of an interregional trade network uh, seen through the material assembly. But what is interesting is that there's very li limited evidence here of a more kind of hierarchically organized society. But there's definitely access to early metal commerce. Um, the second region, Yaren Kalme, has a much more restricted subsistence based on the local ecology. And all the settlement sites and burial mounds are located on the outer crest here in this one, one vegetation zone. The, the region here is definitely part of an interregional trade network. Uh, there's strong evidence of a hierarchically organized society here. There are dozens of you know, these monumental burial mounds and a rich uh, burial assembly. Uh, there's early metal commerce here as well, but it's, what is interesting is sort of it accumulates slightly later than what we see in Inosong. So the, there's kind of this paradox here, you know, the, the, between these two regions. One has plenty of available resources at their disposal, the other, uh, but has limited evidence of a hierarchically organized society. The other have few available resources at their disposal, but a strong hierarchically organized society. So why, why, why is that? Now, if you start by looking at Yar and Kalme, this is an example I think illustrates really well how Bronze Age society is capitalized on natural bottlenecks in a world where people have become more and more dependent on trade. Now, control of strategic areas like harbors and straits sort of necessitates this legitimization of wealth <coughs> and property. And one way to manage this is through an alleged hereditary system, which is witnessed at Yaren and Kaume through long-term settlement sites and erection of dozens of monumental burial mounds at very strategic location as this kind of strait here at the Kaume. 
Uh, and this creates what I've termed a coercive strategy or a coercive society. Uh, it's a region dependent on control of trade. Uh, it's a system built on coercive strategy, but they also tend to be highly unstable uh, because it creates increased competition between groups and creates this dynamic or more oscillating societies. Now, the other region in Osongen is an inner fjord district, which has very few possibilities to capitalize on strategic location in the same way as the coastal areas. Uh, and effective exploitation of the many resources here can at first glance seem difficult in a region with a fragmented landscape and, and a seemingly low population. Uh, now, on the other hand, a cooperative strategy uh, offers obvious advantages for communities that are lacking in certain resources, like having a low population and, and few strategic bottlenecks. Uh, and a well-organized community based on selective tasks would allow them for increased sustainability and, and uh, potentially also lower risks. It may, it may also provide easier access to an interregional kind of market, which again could give them competitive advantage over region exercising alternate strategies. So in the case of Inosongin, interests such as just simply biological reproduction or subsistence optimization may have helped create a dependent system that was also highly stable. Now other motivating factors include access to dominant trends like, like metal of course, and despite being relatively self-sustaining by exploiting multiple resources through cooperation, specifically pastoralism and hunting, communities may have been able to intensify and optimize their production, which would have allowed them to, to kind of position themselves within an interregional political economy. To so serve just to sum this up, um, the sea is seen as a kind of the structuring element and creation of this complexity. However, centralized groups or chiefdoms were established by capitalizing natural passageways but what is interesting is these are particularly visible in coastal areas around 1500 BC and onwards. But they, well, what I argue is that they definitely were reliant on surplus from the subsistence economy from the kind of peripheries, uh, like pastoralism and hunting. And these are particularly visible from around 1950 and 1500 BC. So thank you for your time. Thank you.